Hi, my name is Robert Feranek. I'm from Fedevel Academy. And in this video, we are going to have a look at a cool open source smartwatch project. Wow. Yeah, open source smartwatch. So if you like, you can actually build this smartwatch by yourself. You will find all the uh, information, all the uh, files, what you need to build this smartwatch. You will find them here in this uh, GitHub. Here, for example, you can see the schematics, PCB files. Uh, inside you can find also the Altium files. So if you like, you can modify the PCB. Uh, you will find here also the 3D models and the software, everything what you need to build this. And in this video, we are going to speak also to the creator of this uh, open source smartwatch uh, project. We are going to speak to Sam, uh, or to be precise, uh, I had a call with Sam and I asked him some interesting questions about the project. So if you like, watch this video and you will find out more about how this was created. I think it's it's very interesting to uh, hear the story because it can inspire you to start your own projects. And you will see that even if this uh, looks like a very challenging, very complex, Sam was able to design this smartwatch by himself in his free time. So it's possible to design also like things which basically looks like very complicated, but you can do it. To motivate you to work on open source projects, I'm going to play the part of the video when Sam told me what happened when he finished and released the project. So listen carefully. One of the reasons why I always uh, tell people maybe work on open source project or, yeah. you know, to get uh, not only experience, but they can also get uh, uh, good contacts or maybe even like yeah. interesting offers. So one of my questions for you is, uh, what was the response like? Uh, did you like get some interesting uh, offers or did uh, interesting people contacted you? Or I, I met some really amazing people. Um, and I don't know how much I can talk about them just because I, I don't want to like... You don't need to specify, yeah. yeah. You don't need okay. to. But, but I, I had some, some really big tech companies, you know, like really big tech companies that reached out they're like hey are you looking for a job you know i was like oh well you know if you're offering you know maybe i'll think about it and, and then i had there was a there was a really really wonderful guy from like a tv studio and he's like maybe you know we'd want to do something it's like oh, maybe we want to do something on tv you know and but like everyone was so wonderful everyone was like really really nice okay so i really hope after you watch this video you will start thinking about the project what you could design. Now, uh, let's have a closer look at this uh, smartwatch. Let's have a closer look at this uh, project which was designed by Sam. I uh, highly recommend you to go through this uh, blog post. Here you can find a lot of information and many pictures. So just uh, let's have a look what is here. So this is the uh, 3D model of the uh, enclosure from the top part of the watch, the bottom part of the watch nicely rendered in uh, the CAD software. We will speak about what kind of software he used for this. Printing the uh, enclosure of the watch. Schematic, we will speak about schematic a little bit later. So I'm going to quickly scroll through this. PCB, we will speak also about PCB. 
this is the finished PCB inside of the enclosure assembled with all the chips and components display and this is how it looks when it is finished For the watch, uh, Sam also designed the charger. It's very simple. Again, the schematic and all the uh, all the files. What you need to build this charger, you will find them in this GitHub. But it's very simple, and this is how you charge the watch. So to download the project, go to this uh, GitHub. Simply click on this button and download zip. Once you download the zip file, you can go, for example, inside of these PCB files, watch Altium files, and uh, you can open the schematic and you can open the PCB in Altium. And that's what we are going to do now. When I uh, had a look at the schematic, I was very impressed how simple it is. Because some time ago, I was actually thinking to create smartwatch. And uh, when I was thinking about the project, I was like, oh, it looks so complicated. I'm not really sure what I should use and how to do it. Have a look, have a look how simple this design is. Uh, so here is schematic, here is PCB from the watch. This is the top page of the schematic. If we go on this power page, there is almost nothing. Just a protection. You can see it here on the PCB. Battery is on the bottom of the PCB. So we will not see it now. I will show you the 3D model. You will see the battery. This is the uh, protection for the battery. It's placed here. On the second page, there is the main microcontroller. It is this one. Then uh, some parts around the antenna. So this is the antenna, what you can see here. Test points, these test points here and here. The flash memory where the software is uh, located. This is the uh, connector for display, it is here. This is the vibration motor. So when you receive notification, the motor will vibrate. It, again, it is on the bottom side of the PCB. I will show you the motor when we will have a look on the other side. And the accelerometer. That's it. All the components. And, and, and you can build a smartwatch. Wow. If I open the 3D model or if I enable the 3D model, this is how it looks. And on the bottom side, this is the vibration motor, this is the battery. These are the contacts for charging. There is also a 3D model for the display. I need to enable it because it's, you know, it's quite big, so it's covering all the components. But I think it's interesting to show you how good and how nice 3D model Sam created for this project. I was very, very impressed to see this. As I say, I was very surprised how simple it is. Okay, now uh, let's uh, let's have a look what Sam will tell you about uh, how he was actually designing these uh, these watches and uh, some parts of this uh, are very interesting because you know it's not only PCB design but uh, he had to figure out a lot of things, uh, not just how to create the 
uh, enclosure, but also where to find the uh, glass, the display, a microcontroller, uh, how to program this watch and how to put everything together. And that's why I think the, the call was very interesting when I could hear how all this happened. My very first question to Sam was, uh, how did he come up with the idea to create a smartwatch? And this is Sam's answer. Um, so originally the, the project started, it started about maybe March of 2018. Um, I had this idea. I, I owned a, an Apple watch and I, I started thinking more about the way that I use it and the way that I interact with it. And I found that more and more often I wasn't actually touching or doing anything with the actual watch. The only, the only thing I used it for was what time is it? And am I getting a notification? Right. And, and that was a way for me, if I was in a meeting or something, I could look at the notification and kind of move on. Um, and so part of this project started as a way I wanted to take this, this kind of wild world of smartwatches and shrink it down, you know, make it more simplified because I didn't, I didn't think that for me personally, I didn't need all of the, the crazy things that, that are included nowadays. Um, so part of it was that, right. Part of it was wanting to make something a little bit simpler. And part of it was, I wanted something that was more that kind of fit my style, right? That was more aesthetically me. Maybe you notice Sam mentioned that he started working on the project in March, 2018. And uh, I've got really curious. I wanted to know how long it took to design this smartwatch. And uh, Sam explained that originally he started with a little bit different watch. That's what you can see here in this video. Originally, um, he was using a little bit different microcontroller and also originally uh, the watch was with no graphical display. But uh, once he started working on the watch with graphical display, this is what Sam uh, said. This is how long it took to create the smartwatch. I started the project end of November and I was done early March. So it was about four months. Um, and it was just, and it was stuff like, you know, uh, weekends or, or nighttime or things like that. But it's probably about, I would say 60, 70 hours of total work. So I like guess you, have, you don't have family yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a fiance, um, <laughs> but we, you know, we could be sitting on the couch watching TV and I could be working, next day. <laughs> but no kids, so that, that, that cleared up some of my time for sure. <laughs> so four months, 60 to 70 hours. That's awesome. Imagine in some companies, they have like teams of engineers designing this kind of project and some did it in four months. Of course, this is not like finished product. Yeah, you cannot really sell this to millions of people. There is still work what would have to be done if you would like to sell it as a product. But uh, at this stage, as it is, it's still like maybe 20 to 30% of project, or it depends how much you would like to spend on software design. Yeah, maybe it can be a little bit less. Mm. But as I said, in big companies, whole teams may be working on this and some he just did it in his free time. Wow. Uh, next, we are going to uh, speak about how he decided on uh, the components, what he used in the project. And uh, also you will see that uh, Sam uh, tested everything before he actually uh, created this custom PCB and uh, before he actually created the watch itself. So he bought the development kits and he uh, tried some software, he connected the display and the other things together just to uh, verify if everything is going to work as he's expecting before he uh, designed the watch. Uh, now I'm going to play the video. It's going to be a little bit longer. So uh, 
here it is. You can just watch. Um, what I do for a living is I, I do stuff like this, right? I am the, the majority of the work that I do is like IOT kind of projects. Um, so anything that's internet connected or Bluetooth connected, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm just having my morning coffee. Um, so yeah, so, so what I do for a living is, is this, right? And so luckily, you know, I had the experience and I had kind of the knowledge of what parts I like, um, what parts I don't like, how I want them to all fit together, things like that. So there were, there were some things that were new, right? The, like the display for this watch was new. I'd never worked with it before. So <clears throat> learning how that works. Um, there was the, the, the microcontroller for this project was new. Um, so I had the re the reason I actually picked this microcontroller, and, and we can get into it a little bit later, is originally I picked a different microcontroller. I picked the the PSOC four BLE, um, which is just it's a it's a great little part. The problem was the spy can, um, the spy bus on the PSOC, I think can run, I want to say like four megahertz or eight megahertz or something. Like that. It's like really slow for for a spy bus, um, and the display is driven by a spy controller mm -hmm. right my refresh rate how fast i can change the pictures and things like that is driven entirely by how fast i can drive that spy bus yeah so i had everything planned out in my head i was like i'm gonna use this PSOC. it's gonna it has all the power stuff that i need and you know has all this other stuff great but when it came down to it and i started you know kind of testing things on a breadboard and stuff like that you know my pictures would you could see them loading and and it would take a while to transition to different things and i was like oh well you know maybe i need to go find something there so i i ended up at that point i ended up doing some research i was looking for i wanted a a new microcontroller that was really low power because i wanted this i want the watch to last as long as it can um and i wanted a really fast spy bus so those are my two big criteria mm -hmm. i was looking I'm just making nice. notes, so don't worry. Yeah, if I... um, and so one of one of the, one of the parts that I that I kind of stumbled upon was this dialogue part, the dialogue fourteen six eighty three or something like that. Um, and that particular part, it, it's a it's really really low power, right? I mean, I think the transmit, you know, when it's transmitting BLE, it's it's drawing like four million, you know, peak or something like that, which is great. Um, and I, compared to the PSOC, I think the PSOC was like 19 or 20 or something like that. So was, I was like, this is an awesome part. The spy bus can run at 48 meg. So it was an order of magnitude better. I was like, okay, everything looks good here. Um, so I, it, it was a combination of research on new parts, but generally the architecture of how I wanted to do it, I, I kind of had an idea of what I was planning on doing. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's you know because i was actually expecting or i would not be surprised if you would say like i use something similar in one of my projects before so i yeah. knew uh, i knew the you know capabilities of the microcontrol i i know that uh, it can be used for smartwatches because because it has the bluetooth and a low power so yeah. so no you actually <laughs> found a chip and and that's yeah, like yeah, every, wow everything Everything on here is stuff that I had found at one point or another, right? So, the, so you never uh, use like uh, the motor for vibrations before, or you no? Know, that was that was a new part. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think the accelerometer I'd used before in a in a different project, and there is only battery uh, the protection battery. then. <laughs> well, the, the flash the flash memory I'd used before. Oh, but um, flash that's kind yeah, of standard. I mean, it, it, yeah, spy flash, but and it was just you know it's it's a wind bond chip, so they're all the same, right? You yeah, know, with all of them. But, um, the, but yeah, everything else, everything else was pretty new. I mean, everything else was just you know I I, I found the part that I liked and, and I kind of worked around that. And this is what I would like to actually point out because uh, some people or some engineers they really like to work with uh, the stuff. Not not only hardware design engineers, also software design engineers. They like to work with something what they uh, used before, yeah. Because it's for them like easier way to go. 
So I would like to point out that you actually went yeah. for completely new processor. It means yeah. you had to also uh, learn how to do software for this. Yes. Yeah. That was that was the <coughs> that was the biggest part of the project. Was <coughs> oh my god! I don't know why I'm so coffee. Um, that was the biggest part of the project. Was was learning the 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 you know the RTOS and 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 the the API and everything for for this processor. It was all new, um, but it was pretty easy. I mean, it, in in terms of, I've I've worked with some processors in the past that it's it's hard. Yeah, you know, it takes hours and hours to figure out what you're trying to do. Um, but the dialogue part was pretty good. Uh, I, I was pretty happy with how straightforward it all was. You know? I was very surprised because I never heard about this uh, chip manufacturer. And when mm -hmm. I went on their website, they have like uh, development kits. They have software development, yeah. hardware development kits. I was very surprised how well documented and how much information yeah. they have there. It was, it was great. Um, and, and, I, and so originally when I was working on it before I made the custom PCB, Right. I bought a development board from them. I think it's like thirty dollars or something like that, and that's what I, I was using. Right? I mean, I the the I, I did I changed one thing on their development board. They had it was an, I think they had eight an eight megabit um, spy flash mm -hmm. that they were using. So I took that off and I put a I think I I think I ultimately used like a, a one twenty eight megabit or two fifty six megabit memory. So I just I changed the memory on the on the development board. But other than that, I mean, I. I was able to, you know, pull the pins out and hook them up to the display and <coughs> hook them up to the accelerometer and stuff. So basically, before you actually actually put everything into the watch design, you had everything tested and running with development board and just to be Demper sure that it's going to work. I think so. I think What about display? You connected also the display. Ah, probably yes, because yeah. you said you tested the. Yeah, the display actually was took the took the longest, and I'll, I'll send you some pictures later when we're off the call. I have to find them on my phone, but I I, I actually <laughs> the display has a, a really small connector on it. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a like a DF13 connector or something. I can't remember what it was, but I actually made I really quickly made a PCB with just the connector mm -hmm. and then pins for the breadboard nice. so I could hook up my I could hook up the display to the development board as a way to test things um, oh. and and and, I'll, and we can talk about it a little bit later too but the, the display was a whole it took way too long to figure out how the display actually worked I'm going to interrupt the video for a moment uh, because uh, I would like to say that next we are going to speak about the most difficult challenge uh, during this project and uh, it was uh, how to make the display work. The biggest challenge about the display was because there was no documentation. There is the hardware data sheet which describes the dimensions of the display but there is no documentation which would describe how it works, how to communicate with display. And I wanted to include uh, this part of our call because I would like to encourage you, like uh, if there is something what looks very difficult or even almost impossible, you may be able to do it. Yeah. Even myself, I, fi I find this very inspiring because I would probably go for different different display with full documentation. I would probably choose the easier way and I would keep searching for the display. But you can see, or as you will see, Sam, he didn't. He found the right display and he tried to figure out how it works. So here is the video. It is actually one of my questions because I couldn't find data sheet or I could find the no data sheet. <laughs> the hardware data sheet, but not the software data sheet. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what I had. <laughs> so um, you had to figure out actually what registers are inside of the. No, no, no. I, no, I, I was able to find so that I found that the I think on the hardware data sheet. Yeah, they say says, there is. It says the spy controller is the ST eight eight seven nine V or something like that. Like you okay. know, I'll, I'll flip. 
So I went, I looked up the part number and I found all the registers for the part number, which is good. Um, but the, the hardware data sheet, it shows, um, it shows the, the, the spy pins, right? So it shows the master in, slave out, you know, the master out, slave in, clock, slave select, right? It shows those four pins. And then there's another pin that it, it says, it, I think they call it the, they either call it the WR, the read write, right. or yeah. they call it the, the DC. I can't remember what they call it in this data sheet. But sometimes, <clears throat> so some displays and, and stuff in the past that I've worked with are some sensors. What they'll do is they have the four spy pins, and then they have a fifth pin that is all it's what you it's you either it's pulled high if you're going to write to a register, or it's pulled low if you're going to send data. Right. So it's a it's a data or command. That's all it is. Right. And that way you can do stuff faster. Right. So for forever, I don't know. It must have been two three weeks. Like every night, I was trying to figure out what was going on. I was setting the you know setting the command pin high. And I was sending my my I was sending the information over the spy list, and then I'd set the command pin low, so it was data, and send my data, and nothing was happening, and it was driving me crazy. And so I hooked it up to a logic analyzer, and I was looking at the waveforms to make sure everything looked good, everything looked fine. I you know when I hooked it up to the computer and to the logic analyzer, you know I could read the registers exactly like I was sending them. Everything everything looked good, and I and banging my head against the wall over and over and over, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and then after maybe three weeks or so, I remembered, okay, there was one part that I had worked with years and years ago where instead of having a fifth pin for this data command, it wanted a ninth bit in the word. So you'd mm -hmm. send, send the, a, a one or a zero as the most significant bit additionally to everything else, right? And so I was like, okay, well, I've tried everything else. I might as well try this. So I, so I send this data command, I send the ninth bit with, with the rest of the word, or with the rest of the byte, and lo and behold, everything just started working. Like, oh God, after all this, you know, three weeks of like banging my head, you know, finally it starts working. Um, but yeah, it, 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 was, it was pretty, it was hard to find information, right, for, for that part, because the, the, the manufacturer, the display manufacturer, they just, they give you the mechanical dimensions and the pin out, but and that was it. Why did they was, do it? it? You know, I had, to, I, I had to go looking. I had to go searching for for everything. But they need to know how it works, or or they don't know how it works. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, maybe they thought that by putting just the the driver name, that was enough. And I mean, it was ultimately right. You know, I found it, but. I, I, I did, I think during those three weeks when I was trying to figure out what was going on, I sent an email to the manufacturer and they were fast. They, they got back to me pretty quick. Um, it was, you know, a Chinese manufacturer called Amelin. Yeah, I, I found them. And, and, they, and they got back to me really fast. I mean, that like the same night, you know, they, they sent me an email back like, oh, okay, here's, you know, here's a better version of the, of the mechanical data sheets mm -hmm. so you can add the, the numbers. And then they sent me the data sheet for the driver. Um, they ah, you know, okay, for the chip. Ah. It, yeah, I, unfortunately, by the time they had, they had sent it to me, I had already found it on my own, you know, like a week before. But at least it was good to be like, okay, this is the actual part. I, you know, I didn't find the wrong part when I was when I was searching. Um, so yeah, so so they they sent me the they sent me the chip for the for the spy driver, um, for the chip on the display. Um, awesome. So the driver, it is some kind of like standard chip, like it has registers listed and, and then uh, you just, there is, I don't know, ID register, there is, um, I don't know, write register to yeah. specific position or a specific exactly. color. Yeah. yeah, so the way the way the driver works kind of at a high level is you, you send the driver um, <clears throat> a window. So it, you, you say, this is my X start, this is my X end, this is my Y start, this is my Y end, right? And once you set that window, wherever it is on the actual display, the next thing you send is you just start sending data and it starts filling up from, you know, from left to right, top to bottom, it starts filling it out. And so as you send the data, it sends that, it takes that data um, and stores it in RAM. And it's like the, RGB or? Um, yeah, it's, well, it's it's 16-bit color so, okay 
So yeah, it's it's RGB, but it's a little bit weird. It's it's five R or five bits for the R, six bits for the G, or yeah. Yeah, six it's, bits for I the think G, it's kind of standard. For the, for the blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, it was one of my questions. How how yeah, you were yeah. able to? But but it's kind of tricky, right? Because it's sixteen bit color, but you have to send the data extra bit as well. So you're send you're actually sending eighteen bits total, right? So you send nine bits with, with a zero and then your the first part of the color and then zero again and the second part of your color. You have to do that for every for every pixel, you know, along the way. Okay. And uh, I read on the blog what you created, uh, you had to also write the Windows application to <laughs> transfer pictures into this circle. Yeah. Yeah. So the the display actually it it's a circle, but it treats it treats the display like a square. Ah, okay. So there's actually, there's actually just a part of the display that you can write to. Ah, it just won't, but it's won't not visible. Ah, yeah. Okay, it was it was one of my questions actually. Uh, if yeah, how, how weird how it, it is. Yeah. So? Yeah. No. So it's, it it the the driver thinks it's a square. Okay. But it only, you can only write to the circle. Um, you can write so, to the square, but you you don't see it. Yeah, or... you can write to the circle, but you can only see. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. You can only see the circle. Uh, yeah, so the so the Windows application, what it did is it opened up a folder of pictures that you have. It will downsize them to 240, <laughs> 240 or 240 by 240. Um, and it'll then take if it's a PNG or a JPEG or whatever it is, it'll take that, convert it to a bitmap. Notice how many things Sam had to do and how many things he had to learn. So it's not only about uh, designing the schematic and PCB. It's not only about uh, the software or firmware for, for the microcontroller or creating 3D model of the watch. He had to also uh, do things like create application for Windows. He had to learn the format of uh, JPEG or PNG and, and bitmap files and he had to learn all this to be able to create the smartwatch. And this is, uh, this is something what I always tell people that uh, they should work on as many projects as possible because every time you do something like this, you will learn something new. Uh, you will learn something what you can maybe use in your future project. And all this knowledge, what, what you will get from all these projects will actually make you better engineer because next time you will you will know much more and uh, you will design your next product much better based on everything all the experience what you had in the past i'm sure you understand now enough about the display uh, i asked sam uh, about the enclosure you know about the the chassis chassis, chassis of the watch and uh, i was curious why he went for the wood pla material or how he came up with the idea about the wood pla material and this is what he answered i have a, i have a 3d printer here at home it's a small it's a monoplace mini delta printer so small printer um and i use it for things around the house like you know if, if a you know part of our refrigerator breaks i can you know replace a part or something mm -hmm. like that. um so i was like okay well maybe i'll just I'll, I'll make the design and i'll print it out of black plastic because at least the black will look kind of sleek it'll look nice um i didn't want to do something like bright you know i wanted it to look, look subtle um so I printed out the black plastic and, and it looked okay, right? But it, it looked like plastic. And I think in general, when people see things that are, you know, when, when you see a watch or a phone or whatever that is made out of plastic, it looks cheap, right? Yeah. I and mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't look premium, right? And I was like, I want it to look and feel premium. So I started looking at other ways to make it look nicer. So I took the black plastic I originally tried to, I made a silicon mold out of the black plastic piece 
and then I tried melting pewter, which is a metal. And I tried pouring the pewter into this to maybe have a, a, a pewter watch instead. It didn't come out very good looking. It, you know, the, the pewter didn't really set nice or anything like that. It was definitely my fault. I'm sure if I worked harder on it, I could figure it out. But, you know, after, after looking and looking, I started looking, okay, are there other materials that I can print with? Um, and, and I had done some research and I found there are, there's a company called, I think it's Color Fab, I think is the name. And they make, they make plastics that have metals in them. So you can buy, you know, PLA that has copper mm -hmm. powder in, or you can buy PLA that has, you know, steel or something. And what's cool about those is when you're done with the project, when you're, when you're done printing it, it looks and feels like copper or looks and feels like steel. Right. And, and you can even oxidize it. Right. So like, if you, if you have like a nice copper piece, you can pour some vinegar on it and it gets that nice green patina that like old copper gets and it looks really cool. I was like, okay, well maybe I want to do that. But the, some of the problems with the, with those particular types of plastics is they're very brittle. They break easy. So when they're you, conductive. You, when they're conductive, exactly. So we'll, we'll get to the conductive part in a sec. Um, but I started looking at these and I started trying to figure out what type of materials do I want to use. And, and while I was, while I saw these with the metals, I saw the one with the, with the, with the wood, it's called wood fill. Um, and there are a whole bunch of manufacturers that make it right. I mean, color fab makes it hatchbox makes it there are a whole bunch. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, you know, what do I have to lose? You know, I'll order some, it's $20 for a big spool of it. Um, and I printed some out here at home. I sanded it down and I stained it. I was like, oh, wow, this looks really nice. Uh, the one thing that, that was kind of interesting, let's see if I can get this to show you. You see the dark lines on the front? Yeah. So those aren't, those are fake, right? I mean, I wanted it to look like wood and wood. I, I was actually things. thinking <laughs> if so they are fake. Like or... grain, right? so it's fake grain. So like after I printed it and I sanded it and everything, I took like a, like a, like a, it's called a rasp and it's meant for basically sanding down big pieces of wood, right? And it has these big metal teeth. I just rubbed it back and forth until I got these nice lines and then I added more stain to those. So it kind of set in and made them darker. It was this whole process. It was this whole big thing. <laughs> but in the end, it looks it looks like wood. You it know? looks, and, yeah. And, and even from like, you know, it, it may not come out in the video, but even from up close in person, I mean, it, it looks like wood, which is really cool. You know, I was, I was really, really happy with how it looked. And I thought it was pretty unique, right? You don't see, one, you don't see very many watches that are made of wood. And two, you definitely don't see any smart watches that are made of wood, right? So I was like, this is, this is like a, it's very different. It feels kind of premium, you know, it looks nice. Um, I, I was, I, I, I'm very happy with it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. So. Okay. So the note, what I made here is how many times you had to print it because I have a 3D printer yeah. and when I print something, it looks like it's simple, but I have to do it like a couple of times to find the yeah. exact parameters. Um, if you, how about this? Hold on for two seconds. I'm going to go, mm. I'm going to go grab something. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Very quick interruption. Sam will be back very soon. Uh, I would like to be sure everybody understand what we were talking about. So in case, uh, you have a 3D printer, you need to fill it up with something. And uh, the material which is used to fill up the 3D printer, it usually looks like this. It's, uh, it is uh, sold in these uh, reels. And uh, very often what I also use is the material which is called PLA, okay? And uh, some of these materials, as Sam discovered, some of these materials can be mixed. Uh, you may have like wood PLA material. And that's what he went for. Okay, let's go back to the call. Let's have a look what everything Sam had to print uh, to actually create this smartwatch. All right, so can you see this? Wow. <laughs> So 
this is just some of them. There are more upstairs, right? I, and I made... some of them you just throw away, I guess. Yeah, I mean, and 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 some of them were different designs too, right? So like, this was like one one design that I had an idea for. So it was the round display, but it just had this extra little like notch here on the side. Um, let's see what else I have in here. This one was like a little bit longer, right? How much time did you spend on this project? Because you know what you are talking about is like just learn, just come up with this idea for the enclosure and mm -hmm. try it and do it. It's just like tens yeah. or uh, I don't know, 50 um, hours of it, work or. I, so it's it's tricky, right? Because it's it's how many how much of my time was I actually there versus how much time did I just let the printer go? I mean, I think I probably spent maybe 10 hours setting up the printer, pulling parts off, sanding things, stuff like that. Total printer time, the printer was probably going for 50 or 60 hours without me, right? You know, and, and a lot of these I printed, um, let's see, here, so here's like the actual one printed in black, mm -hmm. right? So some of these I printed at like a, like a low resolution just so I, I could print them fast and see what they looked like. Um, but the, the tricky thing with this particular watch is the display you saw you saw the picture of it but it's a circle and then it has that kind of yeah. bottom yeah. corner and so i had to find a way to kind of hide that and still make it look like a like a like a like a circle right so right if this is if this is the wood the wood one right here on the underside you can kind of see i have the, i don't know if you can see it in the camera or not but let me get some better light you can see there's like a little lip yeah. Look. And that's where the display fits. So although it looks circular, I you know, these these two little parts here at the top where the bands connect, it's really just a way to hide the the extra part of the display. But it's it looks nice. It it, it looks yeah. normal. Yeah, exactly. And that was that was the goal, right? So here's here's another top. This is the bottom piece. So this I don't think I actually put pictures of this in the, the album. Uh, there, I think there are some pictures. I, yeah. yeah, I think there is a picture of this. Okay. Yeah, so this fits, right, just pushes in like so. Um, so there's the whole thing. Very nice. Uh, yeah. I read you use the Fusion 360 or what is it? Yeah, 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 Fusion 360 for the whole thing. I had to interrupt the call again. <laughs> And I Google for Fusion 360 for Hobbyist. And if you like, uh, have a look on this CAD system. I'm going to have a look on this software because I really would like to try it. Okay, in the next part of the call, we are going to speak about the glass for the watch and we are going to speak about antenna. So here it is. The glass. Because I think you didn't mention I may Where did you that. get um, the so glass? Is, yeah, so this is, I don't know if this is the right piece or not, but this is what it looks like. It comes in a little bag. I bought it from this company called Esslinger. Hold it up so you can kind of see it. See, Esslinger.com. Yes, I can see it, yeah. So I bought it from there. It's like a dollar or two dollars for the glass. And they And what they do is this company, they make parts for watches, for normal watches. Um, and so you can buy replacement glass for any type of a watch, right? So I went there and they have regular glass. They have sapphire if you want something harder that you're, you, know, you don't have to worry about as much. And they make every shape and size you can imagine in like half millimeter increments. So I was like, okay, well, I want it to be, you know, 35 millimeters and I want it to be flat. So it sits on top of the screen. Um, and that's it. I mean, it, it, and you, you order it and two days, you know, a couple days later, you just have, 10 pieces of this flat glass and you just, and it fits nicely. There's, it might be hard to see in the camera, but there's a little tiny lip. Yeah, I can see it, yeah. So that's where the, it, the, you put the glass in first, it rests in that little lip and then the screen pushes up against it on the bottom side. So, and how much it costs when, when they make it? A dollar, dollar 25. Really? Very good. I was, I was surprised that I thought that was going to be really expensive. But, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really really cheap because I guess there's so many people with, with regular watches that break them that you know it's 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 not expensive for them to make. So very very cheap. That you can buy if you wanted 
sapphire crystal instead of glass. I think it was like eighteen dollars or something like that. But even then, it's still very still very cheap. yeah still okay. You know yeah. So that was that was the that was probably one of the only pieces on the watch that I didn't actually hand make. Right, it was this piece of glass. But um, you are still good because you were able to figure out all these things. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is hard question. Okay, I'm ready. Antenna. Yeah. How did you come up with the shape of the antenna on the PCV? Yes. So the antenna actually, it's, it's I'm gonna, I'll take this apart really quick so you can see it. The antenna is actually a whip antenna. So the side, the side of the PCB where you see the, the castellated hole, it's actually meant so that I can solder a 31.25 millimeter wire and I can run that. That's what I thought, but I couldn't see it in the pictures. You can't see it in the picture. Yeah, hold on one second. I'm going to take this apart really quick so you can see it. Okay. I, I thought like you come up with some special PCB antenna and... No, 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 no. Okay. I don't know. If, it might be hard to see, but it's over there on, on the... Ah, yeah, I, I can see it. Yeah, it's just that little wire. So part of part of it was I, I wanted um, I wanted something that fit in the PCB or in the, in the case nice. But I also wanted a, I also wanted a way to kind of get away from the display and the battery as much as I could. So I don't lose I don't attenuate my signal into the battery or the or the display. Right. So I needed something I, I looked I was I was debating whether I wanted to use like a chip antenna, right? Like Johansson makes some really good chip antennas that are they're really small. Um, they're very they're very efficient, but I wanted something I wanted a way to just bring it out, bring it away from everything. And so yeah, so the trace goes from the antenna pad on the microcontroller up through a little tiny Pi network. How did you come up with this Pi network because when I check the original design, they... no, there, are no, there are no values. Sorry? In this they have in the this values. Ah, okay. There are no values. No, uh, there is just, I think there is just connector and they have the PCB antenna in the development kit. For, oh, for this, for, for the dialogue part? Yes. Yeah. So typically I, I always put down a Pi network. That's just my, my rule of thumb. I always put down a Pi network in case the antenna doesn't match perfectly to the to to my trace, right? PCB ways is really good. They give you a stack up. You can you can design your your trace and everything to be the right shape and the right thickness and everything. But just in case, I always put down a Pi network so I can tweak it. I can tweak the impedance if I need to. Um, and for this one, I didn't have to. It was it's nice. I could just put a I put a zero ohm jumper. On the series, I, I saw it in the picture. picture. Um, but yeah, I mean, the rule of thumb, I always put one down just so I can change it if I need to. Right. So how do you know that the antenna is fine? It's a good question. So normally for work, if I have a network analyzer at work, so you I look, measure, I can look at the impedance, I can measure, I can look at you know reflective losses and all that. Um, for this, I don't have a network analyzer at home because it's a little too expensive for a hobbyist. Um, but I mean, I turn it on, I let, I, I walk away, I hold my phone and I see, okay, how far am I getting good range? And on this, you know, I can be, I don't know, 20, 20 meters, you know, so it's, I think the Bluetooth spec says you're supposed to be able to get at least 30 meters is, is what you're, you're supposed, the chips are supposed to be designed for. I'm getting about 20, but the reality is my phone is supposed to be in my pocket. Yeah, yeah. The watch is supposed to be on my arm. So if I'm getting 10 meters, that's more than enough, right? So, so you, you just soldered a wire, you cut it in some length, I don't know what length, and it worked? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, so so the wire length is one quarter wavelength, right? Is that's that, So that's what you're supposed to measure too. So the quarter wavelength for 2.4 gigahertz, which is Bluetooth, 31.25 millimeter. So I cut it to 31.25 millimeter. I solder the end to that castellated pad and just let it run. And Interesting topic about the antennas. Now we are going to move to something uh, different. We are going to speak about the 
accelerometer and uh, Sam is going to explain how uh, the watch uh, works, how, how you wake up the watch and uh, possibly how you could control the watch in future. Let's, let's see, all right, so here I'll show you. So here it's off, Yeah. right? And as I turn it this way. Okay. It's on. So the idea, you... normally it's on your wrist like this, right? Flat, and as soon as you turn it up to look at it, it turns on. So, so you don't have like the other uh, what you just mentioned on the beginning like when you touch the side of the watches no, no. that's 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 my next okay. chunk of software that i need to do but okay. the the accelerometer works really I, i've used that kind of stuff before in other projects where you, you do the tap gestures mm -hmm. um and it works really well so i mean the, the the idea is you turn it on by looking at it first unless it's if it's not on nothing happens so as soon as it turns on, then it starts looking at the accelerometer data. And if you tap on any of the sides, then it just does something. You know, it, 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 it can be tricky if you're worried about, so some of the projects that I've had in the past where we've tried to use accelerometer data for tap gestures, it gets hard because you're not using, um, you're using the accelerometers, both the wake up and the tap happen mm -hmm. simultaneously. But if you do the wake up first, and then there's there are no other time, there, basically, if the accelerometer is not being used for anything else other than the tap, it's okay. It gets tricky if you're trying to be able to do gestures and tap at the same time. If you are running, if you're running and trying to tap, that's that's a little bit harder. But and uh, we kept speaking about the accelerometer a little bit longer. I don't want to make this video like too long, so we are going to move to the next topic, what we were speaking about, and it's soldering. How did you check if it's soldered uh, properly? Did you have some... Did you check it by software or something? How did you know there is contact on every path and there is no short circuit between the paths? When I, when I first boot stuff up, um, or when I first actually I should say when I first finish soldering stuff, right? When it comes out of the oven, the first thing I do is I check with you know with a, with my multimeter. I check you know is five volt to ground shorted? Is three point three volt to ground shorted? Okay. I check the I check all the important ones. Um, sometimes there, are, yeah, I'm sure on one of the boards that I've done, there's one pad on that dialog part that's accidentally bridged to another pad, but I don't use them, so it's not a big deal, right? Um, the the big moment right the big aha moment is can you can you flash software onto it if it works great if not then you're like oh god how do i fix this you know and you sit there with the hot air and a lot of flux and you pull the part off and you look to make sure they're you know it's not bridged and you put it back down and you try and you know you give it a couple of taps and, and say okay pray with me you know but it usually correct itself if it's more like wrong position it yeah, floats a little bit and yeah yeah so luckily with the reflow it, it adjusts itself the big problem with with this part is in addition to all the little pads all around there's that big ground pad yeah. in the middle and it's really close to that inner row i think it's, it's only like it's only like six mil or eight mil away from that inner row so if either there's too if you have too much solder on the ground pad it just... it, it, well, if it floats a little bit too high, okay, right, then those that inner row isn't connected at all because it's just floating. If there's too, sometimes if there's just a little bit too much, it kind of connects to all those inner pads. If there's not enough, the ground isn't connected, so it's like it's like a very fine balance, right? You, you know what I do? Usually, I uh, use the uh, solder with uh, light. So mm -hmm. it has a lower temperature, melting temperature, yeah. and I and I uh, and I put it on the pads, yeah. like with my soldering iron. I put it there, yeah. and That's then I idea. just melt it. Yeah. So what what I did for this was, um, I had the stencil. I, I applied the paste. I put it in the oven, and then my my like trick is once it comes out of the oven, I put it down. I put a whole bunch of flux all around it, so it's like just a ton of flux all over. And then I sit there with the hot air and I let everything reflow again. And while it's reflowed, 
I'll take some tweezers and push on the top of the part straight down. And that kind of pushes out all the extra solder, right? So it, it kind of like, like, like squishes it all out. And once, and then once it's all squished out, you know, I'll take the hot air off and then I'll come back with my iron and I can just kind of pick up all that extra solder. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to work really well for, for, I do that a lot with like BGA parts or like QFN parts that have a big ground pad or something like that. You just reflow and then push down on the, on the top of it and it kind of squishes out all the extra. And it's not like bubbling. If you put that like a lot of flux, it, it may be like the bubbles. No, 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 no. And... It's, it's pretty no? good because you put it, the flux, you put it on top of the part ah, after you- So you don't put it down, okay. You put it on top after you've reflowed, right? So after, after, the, after the solder the first time has already been melted in, right? You put it on top and then what happens is m most of the flux ends up just evaporating away with the hot air, but a little bit kind of makes its way under and that helps to reflow everything underneath. Okay, I, I never try it this way. Yeah. Usually yeah. usually I just put a little bit of tin on the pads because I, yeah. I usually I don't have the stencil. So yeah, I just yeah. put the, the, the solder, then yeah. I put flux, but not too much because if it's too much, it starts. Yeah, that's yeah. And then I just uh, use hot air gun and melt it. Yeah. I'll have, to, I'll have to take a video so I can so I can show you what it looks like. But it it, it works really well because it basically if you reflow it once with the stencil, usually that's enough solder to keep everything in place. Yeah. Right. Um, but sometimes you just get a little bit too much where you're bridging between two pads. So then you put a ton of flux on, and that kind of it will it yeah split. separate everything. Yeah. And you kind of tap on it once or twice on the top, and all the extra kind of comes out. And, it, and for some reason, it doesn't get sucked back in when you let go. You like you tap, boop, boop, boop. It all squeezes out, and you just let go, and everything you know hardens up. It cools down, and you have these big kind of balls of solder all around the part. And you just go back with your iron, go, you know, go around it in a square, or whatever, and 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 you kind of suck it all away, and that's it. And then you're done. So, do you have your own oven? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I have my own little oven because I'm 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 crazy like that. Uh, <laughs> what what kind of oven do you have? It's a it's a it's a small little reflow oven. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's the T nine six two or something it's something like that. It it's like a two hundred dollar little reflow oven. Um, uh, is that like a profile or you just have like one temperature and yeah, that's no, it? it? It has it has a profile and everything. It's, really. It's very, yeah it's, how do you I'll, is it connected to a computer or how you set up the profile no there's there are four buttons on it um and you just you click on you you know you can you can cycle through different profiles and you can adjust them you know with the four buttons the it it's got some pretty crappy firmware so the buttons are actually they're not um they're not interrupt driven the buttons they're all pulled so what happens if you if you're holding the button just accidentally just a little bit too long it'll like go through like 10 menu items all at once you're like oh no no, that's not what i wanted to do and you have to like go back but but it works but the actual reflow part of it works really really well um and i use it for all sorts of stuff i mean and and, and it's it's pretty cheap for for a reflow oven. i mean 200 you know, it's, it's not, 200, yeah, it's yeah. not bad. It, it's the most expensive thing i have in my lab is my little reflow oven but what yeah, about microscope I don't have one and I need to get one. I, I, I was one. when I was watching the video when you were uh, using the tweezers and putting the components, yeah. I was like, I, I couldn't do it with a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need I need to get one. I need to get a microscope because my eyes are starting to get worse now. And now when I'm doing like O201s or if I'm doing like really fine pitch QFN, it's a lot harder to see now than it used to be. But yeah, most of it's just, you know, get really close, you know, Put down uh, it all doesn't stuff. work for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the times when uh, I used to fit components with no microscope? Ah, long time ago. Uh, but uh, I would like to tell you, the microscope is not uh, only good for fitting the very small components. Microscope is also very good to check the quality of the soldering because through microscope, you actually can see 
how well the components are soldered. If you if you use just uh, naked eye, you can solder the components, but uh, you may not be able to see the quality of the soldering as good as you would see it through microscope. Okay, we are going to move to uh, firmware. So the in the next couple of minutes, we are going to speak about firmware. Here it is. Three pads in the top corner are the UART lines. It's TX, RX, and ground. The bottom four are for single wire debug. So single wire clock, single wire IO, reset, and ground. So for to upload new firmware, JTAG, whoop, you know, touch it down and 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 it and it works. You had to um, buy a JTAG or uh, they use standard JTAGs or um so for this I I bought there's a it's, it's called the JTAG EDU or something like that. It's twenty dollars. Um and it's full JTAG. Um and what uh, what software you use with it? So that along with the so when you down when you buy the JTAG EDU, you can either use like the Seger like JTAG full software suite, or for the dialog part they have their own IDE. It's called Smart Snippets, I think okay. is the name of the. Suite. And with Smart Snippets, they include like a JTAG license type thing where, you know, it has the full tool chain and everything, and will and will load everything over the JTAG. Um, so very easy. You just click, you know, build and download, and it's good to go. Okay. And now uh, you solder down the wires on the PCB, or how you use the um, points? Well, I have two ways I've done it. Um, originally, for the first one that I did, I soldered four wires to those four JTAG pads, and I and then I hooked those up to the little, the little JTAG EDU that I have. Um, later on, I actually I made a jig, so it just it has pogo pins. I just boop, Hold it, hold it on there, flash it, and then pull it off. So by finger, you just hold it there and... Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's making contact with those four pads, it tends to be pretty good. So um, you don't use it for debugging, just uh, upload firmware? Or... Yeah. yeah I, I, so if I was early on in the process when I was still doing a lot of debugging, I had, this, I had ah, the four okay. wires, um, and, that, and that was good for that. Um, yeah, but once, once I had an, enough stuff that was working, you know, then I could just use the jig, you know, kind of push it down, and that was enough. And uh, how do you use the UART? So you don't need the UART? The UART's only used when I upload new images. Ah, so okay. I use, I use the Windows program. So ah, okay. New. Yeah, so it's it's 90, or it's 920 baud, you know, or 900 kilobaud, or mega, yeah, it's kilobaud, or kilo, kilobit per second baud. Um, okay. So, and... Uh... What was the first uh, firmware what you uploaded there? Was it something what you prepared on the development kit or? The first one, yeah, was was all development kit stuff. Um, but, you know, there were some some things that I had to change. You know, pinouts for certain for certain things that changed on the custom board versus the the dev kit. But most of it was pretty straightforward. Um, the I didn't I think all of the development for the accelerometer stuff I did on the actual custom board since I'd used it in the past I was like it's an I2C chip I know how it works I'm just going to put it down you know I, I, it's worked before I'll, it'll work again um, but yeah I mean most of it was most of it was pretty straightforward the the spy flash I already had working on the development board the display I already had working on the development board. So when I moved over to the custom board, so you already had something. The, the big, the big things were already working. Right? Okay. The, the, the important things were already working. Now this was about the firmware which is inside of the watch. Uh, I was also curious how the phone can send the notifications to the watch. You know, how this works, how this software works, how this uh, process works. And uh, of course, I ask Sam, how the watch talks to your phone? Because uh, in the blog I read, uh, you had to somehow connect it to notification center. So I'm not exactly sure how this works. And do you have also your own application which is talking to the watch? Or no, no? Application. no application. Um, and that was that was actually one of the reasons 
why it was easier to do, right? Because so for iPhones, they ha Apple has a set of characteristics. Um, or, I, I'll start by saying it's over Bluetooth. Okay. Everything is. Um, and I don't know how familiar are you with Bluetooth. I I've done one project with Bluetooth and uh, iOS. Okay. So Bluetooth in general, or Bluetooth low energy, LE, right? It, the way it works is the best way to think of it is like it's like an apartment building, right? Like a big apartment building. And so you have one apartment, which is your device, and then you have all of these individual apartments inside the building that ha that have um, some set of features, I some, think. Some set of features, exactly. Yeah. And each, and then inside each inside each apartment, there are a whole bunch of rooms. And their characteristics, and 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 you can and you can kind kind of dive deeper. But Apple has what they call the Apple Notification Center service, or something like that, um, ANCS. And what it is is, if you um, if you in I guess enroll your device or pair your device with this characteristic, there are three there are three characteristics in this service. Um, there's a notification point, a data point, and something else. I can't remember what it is. But basically, it has three ways of communicating with you. One is just the notification says, hey, you received a notification, and it's read only. The next one is a write. And so you can say, OK, I want to know more about the notification. And then the last one is it will just send you more information about that characteristic. So it's very easy. It's it, or, easy enough, right, in terms of Bluetooth stuff. Um, and it's so pretty straightforward. So you don't, you, don't need, you don't need an app. You don't need anything else. Everything and is set up in the software inside of the watch. You just need to set the correct characteristics or? Um, and then you pair the watch with your phone, and it automatically knows how to talk to your watch. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, there was, there, there was, there was Bluetooth stuff that I had to write for the watch. Um, but yes, so once once it's paired, the phone doesn't need an app or anything. It just knows that if there's something paired with it that has that ANCS profile, it will just send notifications to okay. it. Okay. See, another thing, what you can learn from this project, Bluetooth. And that's exactly why I really love this smartwatch. It's all teeny tiny hardware, but many things what you can learn working on something like this from hardware design schematic pcb layout through firmware development through the uh, mechanical design up to the bluetooth or uh, you know how these uh, devices can talk to uh, to your phones even like uh, developing application on windows it's like wow Maybe if you are not sure what you should be doing uh, and how you could learn more, maybe have a look at this project. It can give you like really nice start uh, and uh, you can get a lot of knowledge about a lot of stuff which you may uh, find very useful when you are designing your own product. Uh, okay, uh, this was uh, everything like uh, quite technical. There are few videos what I would like to show you from the call where we will where we were speaking maybe about a little bit more general things and uh, what I was curious about I wanted to know what were the moments when uh, when Sam uh, was like yes it works and uh, this is what Sam uh, explained. For me, the, the big moment in this project was was a lot of like code based stuff. There was a lot of software, right? Like getting the Bluetooth working. I was like, yes, you know, like getting the display working, you know, one of those. But I, I think hardware wise, this was a pretty straightforward project for me. Um, software wise, it was a lot more complex. So I was pretty happy when when all that kind of stuff worked. I do you know it's connected together. Usually, yeah, exactly. Usually exactly. Usually when, when I do this, yes, it's like when you see the board booting up, yes, exactly. it's booting. Yeah. It work. Yeah. You have the yeah. first pixel there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And everybody's yeah. Is, is looking at you like, what? 
<laughs> what is C C? <laughs> yeah. Another oh, another good one was okay. So the the microcontroller, the the dialog part, it's a QFN, but it's a two row. QFN. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Kind of like a VGA QFN mix, and each of the pads is ten mil by ten mil. Right, they're they're small pads, and I I was placing everything by hand. Right, so I had my stencil. I placed everything by hand. So for me, the the biggest like yes moment was when I powered it up and there were no shorts. You know, nothing was short circuited or, or you know like a, and it booted up for the first time. I was like, oh my god, it actually worked. I placed it in the right spot. You know, so that was that was a big moment. But yeah, it was. It, it, I guess there were a lot, right? I mean, all throughout the project, like different different parts, okay, like. When I first printed the house and everything fit, I was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" You know, or like when I, you know, when I designed the PCB and, I, and like the antenna stuff just kind of looks nice in the corner, I'm like yes, or the display, or you know, so a lot of good moments. This is why I like to design boards. Yes, because of these yeah. moments. <laughs> yeah, that's it's addicting, right? I mean, it's that's 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 exactly it. And uh, after the happy moment, I also ask if there were like sad and bad moments when uh, he wanted to give up on this project. When this, when the display wasn't working originally, I was like, okay, maybe maybe this display just doesn't work the way they say it works. Or I was like, I was like, maybe this just isn't meant to be right. This project that was that was a big one. Um, I, I almost, I almost gave up. Um, there was, I'm trying to think if there were any others that were like, when, when I realized that I had to write a windows application to make the images for me, I was like, Oh God, what am I doing? Is this worth it? Like, do I, am I really going to put in all this time to make something else just so I can load the pictures onto the watch? So I, at that point I was like, maybe it just isn't worth doing anymore. We'll see, blah, blah, blah. So I think those are the two big ones, and and I think in the end they both ended up having to do with the dis like what shows on the display, right? Like, one was the display working, and two, what kind of pictures were on the display. So, don't give up. It may look like, oh, of course, don't give up, but when you are uh, creating something uh, really complicated or something like awesome then uh, there are these moments and many people they will just stop working on the project because uh, you know they think there is no solution but uh, always when you are creating something great it's going to be hard you need to keep working on the project and then once you finish it it will be like wow uh, Okay, in the next clip, uh, we were speaking about open source. I have uh, designed a couple of open source projects uh -huh. and uh, uh, I sometimes I little bit, I'm a little bit like, uh, um, I don't want to say like disappointed, but sometimes people use the work without, you know, giving credit and, mm -hmm. and uh, you spend so much time uh, right, maybe, to right, put it yeah. there and someone just take it and they they remove all the references to you and just put their, their logo and I was like uh, I'm not going to do open source anymore because it's like uh. so right. have you had this kind of moment like maybe I shouldn't do it open source <laughs> <laughs> um, it's too soon maybe <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I've done I've done other open source projects in the past, um, and yes and no, right? I I think I think a big part of it is I think back on when I was first learning, when I was first becoming like an engineer, and I was in university and everything, and I remember looking through all these other people's open source projects, and I remember being so grateful, right, that they put these projects up and I could learn from other people's work. And so this is, this is kind of my way to like pay it back to the community. Like, I think that this is a cool project that that I worked on, and I want other people to be able to do it too. If that's what if that's what they want to do, if they want to change it and they don't want to credit it, look, 
I don't I don't love it, but you know that's that's just part of it, right? Yeah. And, once and once you way. once you put it out, there is no right. way back. <laughs> yeah. And but the way I see it is I think the I think the majority of people are good people. And so to say no more open source projects because one or two bad people use the project wrong. One or two people used it wrong. One or two people use it wrong. As long as a hundred people got to enjoy it for what it was. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how I feel about it. Right? It's sometimes I'm like, I know it's helping many people, but when I yeah. see, you know, I know many companies they use my open source project, and they yeah. some of them some of my open source projects are not open for commercial use. Right. And uh, I can see that some people they ask me about licensing and this stuff, and they never come they never go back so they never right. pay anything right. so yeah, it's hard it's, hard. it's uh, you, you, know, you you basically never get almost anything back from the open source project yeah. except the good feeling that you <laughs> you gave and something that's, back that's pretty, that's pretty much it um there was there was someone who who reached out to me and they said to me look i really appreciate everything you're doing for this project and they they were like I, I'm I'm planning on ordering a whole bunch of these PCBs. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a whole bunch made, and I'm gonna sell them on eBay. Is that okay? And I was like, of course. You know, you it's it's your money. If you want to make the PCBs, go enjoy, have fun. And he, and this person was so grateful, and they were so and thankful that they've actually for every for every PCB that they sell, they've just been sending me one dollar. You know, and I was like I was like this is so like I did not expect anything from it, right? And it and it was and it was. You know, I'm so thankful, right? You know, it's it's not it didn't have to be anything, and and they just like they offered this like that's, here I want you, awesome. I want you to have like one dollar like I'm gonna donate for every one that I sell I want you to have a dollar just so in the future you can keep making cool projects. It's like this is so nice of you. You really didn't have to, um, and and it and it really was. I mean, it, like it encourages me to like do more projects like this because I can see how the community has kind of responded, and it's been really fun to watch. Oh so, yeah, some people they are nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some people are nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, there were a lot of there were a lot of I, so you know when when this thing got big, you know, it like kind of blew up, right? And there were all these articles, you know, and Gadget had one, and The Verge had one, and some of these other websites. But there was I'm trying to remember what it was. There was one there was one website. I'll have to find it later. But all of the comments. On, on, on the article were all like oh well you know my Fitbit watch can do something better <laughs> or like oh it doesn't even run Android watch like, why would I want this and and but then so there were like you know 20 of 20 comments like that and I, and, I, and at first I was like reading through and I was like oh well, I guess I guess they didn't like it as much as I thought they would but then at the very end there was one guy and he just like and he was like you guys are all a bunch of like you're all a bunch of jerks like this guy made this for himself it's amazing. It's beautiful. Like, you guys should be grateful that he even put it online. I was like, oh well, I guess you're right. They're, like, they're, you know, there's a mix. There's like some people that that like it and some people that don't. Um, but I, I mean, I probably got hundreds of of comments of people saying, you know, wonderful things, really nice things, and it was and it was really it was like heartwarming. Like, I really like it. It, it makes me want to do more projects like these in the future. I uh, have nothing to add to this, uh, you know, how some explain why some people are doing open source. It was very nicely explained. In the next clip, I ask Sam how all this popularity around his project started. I, I originally I posted this on, on Reddit. And everyone on Reddit was wonderful. Everyone had nothing but nice things to say and fun questions to ask. And I was having a blast. You know, my, my, I posted it at like, I don't know, like seven o'clock at night, my time, which is apparently I've learned is not the right time to post things on Reddit. If you want to post stuff on Reddit, I've learned you're supposed to do it in the morning so that it has all day for people to look at. But I posted it at like seven o'clock. And I was sitting next to my fiance and she was like, she was doing some work. Um, and all of a sudden I start getting, you know, responses and questions and things like that. And, and, and at first it was like, you know, one or two or four, 
and then it started speeding up more and more and more and more and by like nine or ten o'clock i had hundreds of, of comments and questions and i'm like trying to answer every one of them i'm like like i, I promise I'll, I'll get back to everyone you know just it might take me until tomorrow you know to answer everyone but for the next like two or three days like that's like that's what i was doing i was like sitting on my couch just like answering questions for people um and it was it was so much fun it really was like getting to interact with all these people all across the world you know i've had people i've had people reach out from like from vietnam from uganda from you know switzerland from you know parts of south america and it's and it's really fun to see people from all over the world that get to kind of enjoy these projects and so i i had a blast i really i really had a good time yeah but you know you you were also kind of lucky because it's not easy to actually get this kind of attention even like oh, yeah. if you if you create an awesome board sometimes you yeah. need to be a little bit lucky to get oh. picked up with, with someone who is absolutely no question and and i think that like i think so i got really lucky you're right the the next so the next morning after i posted this there was a writer on in gadget which is like this tech blog and they wrote a story on it they, they saw it on reddit they wrote a story on it and that all of a sudden like you know after that happened everyone saw it like it just like it blew up you know and it was and you're right it was totally luck like this person thought it was cool and they wrote a little you know two paragraph thing on it and it was wonderful um but it that that was like very much like it caught fire right you know like yeah i i know exactly how it is i actually read about this on cnx software yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And... yeah so there, there were a ton of like so yeah so cnx software had one i think hackaday did one there's one on in gadget one on the verge android police there were like a whole bunch of like like big you know websites that i like it's like oh my god you know like i and it was so fun because i re i like pretty much read all those websites every day anyways right so like it was just like trying to find out like what's new in the world myself and like i'm scrolling through i'm like oh my god that's my face you know like i'm on the web you know <laughs> right it was, it was really cool was yeah really cool. i i saw uh i think the blog your yeah. blog post it has like hundred sixty thousand views or yeah it was crazy like all of a sudden and and i, I was like talking to my, like my grandparents and i was and i was like oh my god it's has like 40,000 views like look at all these people and they're like oh my god look at all these people that are looking at your things like we don't understand it but we're so proud of you <laughs> <laughs> okay we are almost finished uh, there is only one more uh, video what I would like to show you and here it is uh, one of my question is uh, what I see a lot some people or many people they start uh, working on something and after like three weeks they just you know leave it yeah. and so uh, what is how do you do it how do you do it that you are able to finish the project so long project yeah that's a good question because I also have that problem sometimes sometimes <laughs> there are projects that I that I start and you know I'm like oh well it's not really going anywhere maybe I'll, just, I'll come back to it later and then three years later it's still you know half assembled um i i think this project in particular was because i had to do so much learning for it i really enjoyed it um i think uh -huh. project where i where i pretty much know everything that i need to know to finish it those are the projects that i tend to not finish right does that it, so the because it's not so to, exciting yeah yeah exactly you know and so you know like i'd mentioned earlier i i'm addicted to making new things but part of that addiction is because I love learning new things. And so once I run out of things to learn about, then the project isn't as exciting. It's boring. It's boring, right? <laughs> but because this project up until the last day, right? I mean, literally the last day that I was working on it, I was still learning new things. I think that's why this project made it all the way to the end, right? Otherwise, I, I, you know, I think it would have fallen apart at some other point. but. I think whenever I whenever I tell people to start, you know, working on personal projects or, or making things for a hobby, I always tell them to do something that's outside of their comfort zone, right? You know, try and do something that's hard, something that you've never done before, because those are the projects that you actually end up making. Those are the projects that you finish 
because you learn and it feels it feels rewarding to finish a project where you you had to learn everything new right painting you know painting a bench in my backyard that may take me it's work you know, that's six, work yeah six months right because it's boring exactly so it, it's just it's just i think i think finishing a project definitely comes from having something fun to work on or fun to learn and uh, that's everything for uh, today's video i really would like to thank you very much to sam for for the call it was very nice and i really hope also you like the call uh, let us know leave the comments uh, let me know if you like this kind of format of the videos talking to different people and also leave comments about uh, some work leave comments for sam let him know if you like the project i will also attach some links into description under this video so if you would like to uh, maybe find more information about the project about sam the links will be there and uh, yeah i would like to thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next time bye